Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. Thanks for being with us today. Since Nigeria's return to democratic governance in 1999, its judicial system has played a key role in the developments that have taken place from resolving election disputes to interpreting laws as well as examining their suitability. But the judiciary has also been in the spotlight for the wrong reasons, from accusations of corruption and nepotism to other misconduct by practitioners. As the nation is in its 23rd year of democracy, where does this all-important third arm of government stand? Newsnight talks to foremost lawyer, senior advocate of Nigeria, Chief Wale Olanipekun. Chief Olanipekun, thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you, Oladi. Let's, uh, let's begin uh, with an overview of uh, the legal profession, uh, more broadly speaking, and I don't want to go too far back if we just take it in the last decade. Uh, that's talking of 2010 to now, which is about 12 years. What do you think there have been incremental steps of improvement, or has it been, as some critics have said, going backwards uh, from the days when you started out, or is it as some people would say a mixture of both. Um, I would say, I would want to say it's a, a mixture of both, a potpourri of a sort. Uh, they are the ugly, the good, and the bad. Or let me put it this way, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, 12 years back, the legal profession was fairly stable, highly respected, Noble, indeed, rooted in nobility, enshrined in industry, respected all over the country, substantially accepted as a leading profession in Nigeria. And by the way, without being immodest, the legal profession is the leading profession in the world. It's the leader of all professions. <laughs> Chief, why do you, you say can't that? Be, you can't be a doctor without going through the, you know, medical law. Law applies to accountancy, to pharmacy, to engineering, to everything. Law supervises all professions. God himself had to make that to make law for the Israelites. There was a void after the creation. Not void, I'm not talking of the void when God breathed through his Holy Spirit to the voidity. And there was life, there was water, but there was void in terms of organization, in terms of assemblage of men, human behavior, until God gave Israelites the laws. And since then, the laws of man have always aped the laws of God. But let us now go back to what we were 12 years ago, just suppose and compare or compare with what we are today. In terms of, and when we talk of the legal profession, I'm talking of the bar and the bench, yep. the entirety of the profession. And the legal profession is one. Under the Legal Practitioners Act, you are either a legal practitioner or you are not. And the definition of a legal practitioner covers whether you are a lawyer, whether you are a judge. And that reminds me of the case of Atake against the Federal Republic. When the Supreme Court was now giving his judgment, Atake, a retired judge, was described as a legal practitioner. So, to bring home my point, about 12 years ago, or as of 2010, number of lawyers in Nigeria, over 50, about 50,000. Today, about 105,000. Astronomical rise, increase, exponential. America, in terms of numerical strength, where are the jobs? About 10 years back, Lawyers could readily pick some jobs here and there, whether in the 
ministry, whether in private legal practice, whether going to the bench, whether as a magistrate, whether as a secretary, whatever, whatever. Or whether even joining the police or the custom. Today, what is the problem? What is the situation? 10 years ago, I've, and let me also say this, I've seen it, I won't say all, or let me say I've seen it substantially, this deeply well, fairly well. I've tried as much as possible in my career to cover the field in and out of this country. And I can compare what the situation has been in other countries, in other crimes, with what the situation has been with us. Are we declining? Are we progressing? Are we taking one step forward and two steps backward? Within the past decade, our fortunes have, our fortunes, fortunes have been nose diving. Integrity being questioned, our honor being eroded. The sanctuary of justice is not as respected as it should be. I give a recent example, Ensa's protest. How did it end with us as professionals? How did it affect the legal profession? The first court built in Nigeria, that's the High Court of Lagos State. It used to be the Supreme Court. It was burnt down. Brazilian, no qualms. Went straight to Kitukupa, down there in the hinterland, courts of law, burnt down. In a way, courts of law, burnt down, attacked. Assuming lawyers and judges were inside those courtrooms, what would have happened? Something is wrong. And when we had a meeting of the body of senior advocates, we pondered over it that this kind of things, this kind of attacks, are not accidental as they would have appeared. They were deliberate. Sign of disappointment in the legal profession by the public. To my mind, legal profession should be the bulwark, the sanctuary where everybody comes to against oppression against the humanity of man to man. And that's why section 6 of the Constitution says, when vesting superior courts with jurisdiction, to interface, to adjudicate in matters between government and government, government and you know, citizens inter se, or citizens inter se, there is no institution vested with so much power, so much authority, so much jurisdiction not even the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So is there a protest against us? The answer is neither here nor there. But then, why the cause of law? To me, we have to halt the drift. We have to stop the madness. We have to arrest it. We have to exercise it. It wasn't happening. I'm glad you come to your question again. Whatever narration I give, I will just oppose it. I will link it with 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Was this happening 12 years ago? Did we ever say this 12 years ago? I will say no. Now, what of appointment of judges? What was happening 12 years ago? Is it what we are continuing now? I will say, no, not exactly. Now, when you now compare what is happening in other jurisdictions, our common law we, you know, is rooted in English common law. Law in Britain has been in existence for years, for centuries. The first Nigerian lawyer, Chapola Williams, was called to the bar in 1888. So, judges are still respected over there. Law is even seen as an end in itself. 
an end to regularize, to regulate the society, an end to bring discipline to the society, an end to correct politicians, leaders, powers, and principalities, an end to tame criminals, an end to settle disputes fairly, without being unfair, without being unjust, without being preju pre 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 prejudicial to any of the parties. You are asking the question because you appreciate the very importance of law and the legal profession. Law is to mankind what oxygen is. We are here, we don't see oxygen, but we are breathing oxygen. Without oxygen, we are gone. And like my lecturer, you know, if you don't care, in law school, blessed memory will say, we are gunners. So without law, there will be anarchy. Without law, we are going to plunge into a state of anomy, what sociologists call a state of you know, numblessness. And again, like the time of creation, a state, you know, a state where there is void. There will be no there will, darkness will, will unleash naturally on the hemisphere and the Nigerian hemisphere, God forbid, once law is not law. And law has to be law. Like how there Shaw posited, said, what is the essence of law if law cannot correct the injustice law has brought about? Okay. Twelve years ago, you could go to our courts and argue freely as lawyers that we are giving decisions par inculiam. Par inculiam means mistake of the law, mistake of facts, human mistakes, not because you are accusing any judge or being biased. And we have situations where that has been done, where it has been done. I did it, not once, not twice. We have law reports where the Supreme Court, led by Belo, DSC, later CDN, will give decisions to say, we are sorry, we made mistake. But does it, Chief, does does it, it sorry Chief, <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but do, does it speak to the, quali the how, because you referenced it in your answer. Yeah. You said the quality, the people who no, are now judges. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the quality. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the quality. I'm talking about what was happening there. I will not want to attack the quality of the people who are judges. But I want to say what I want. We are, you have asked me a question about what was law, the situation of law, yes. 12 years ago. And now. And now. But now we also have a situation whereby you go to courts and the courts will say, no, we cannot review our judgments. We cannot look at mistakes. But again, we also have, you know, the good news is that even the APS court that said it on one occasion, and in fairness to the APS court, it was on, only on one occasion, or at a, or to a season. The Supreme Court never said it before. And I stand to be corrected. I stand to be corrected. But before you know, putting myself in the dock for correction, let me make this point. You don't often go to the Supreme Court to say, you know, Revisit your decision. Set aside your judgment. But when you know that there has been a mistake of the law, there has been a human error, and you have the facts, you have to, you can go there. And they will do. And it happens all over. And good enough, in the latest decision of the Supreme Court, about two months back, in GTB and Innocent, a full court, seven of them, they said, no, we have that power. We have the jurisdiction. We have the mandate. We have the authority. It's within our right. It's in the rules of our court to revisit our decisions that are wrong. And that has been the position of the law. I'm happy also that the Supreme Court is coming to that realization. Now, 
12 years ago, there was no COVID. <laughs> 12 years ago, there was no IT. There was no internet. Now what do we have? We have to move our own courts, at the legal profession has to move on what I would call the super highway. That is the end thing now, and we have to learn. We have to kill. We have to join. Things are changing. So, by and large, I want to say honestly that just we are say that the fault is not in ourselves, it's not in our stance, but in ourselves. I will say whatever faults we have noticed, whatever faults have been identified in the legal profession in the last 10 years or thereabout, some have been self-inflicted. Some have been fostered on the legal profession by extenuating circumstances, by the environment, by the nuances of our politics, of our constitution. Ladi, it's only in Nigeria, and I also stand to be corrected, that judges determine who govern. And when I say who govern, I'm not talking of one person, so I mind my language. I'm not saying who governs, because it's not an accidental situation. When you look at all the 36 governors in Nigeria, nearly all of them have had their cases prosecuted, challenged, either at pre-election or through the tribunals, from the tribunal or from the High Court, as the case may be, to the High Court, the Court of Appeal, to the Supreme Court. Buhari was no exception. When you look at Hosbury's laws of England, Again, where we borrowed our common law and where we supposedly borrowed our democracy, it is written there. A court should not substitute its judgment with the wishes of the people demonstrated through the ballot box. Through the ballot box, the people surrender their mandate, their sovereignty to the people, to those they have elected. It is not. It is the duty of the court to adjudicate. It is the duty of the court to look at election petitions. But I dare say, it is not the duty of the court, of any court, whatsoever and howsoever, to decide to say, we will put this man, we are putting this man, we are declaring this man as governor. In, circum in certain circumstances, except in clear court cases. Because you have to look at the wishes the corporate wish or wishes of the electorate. Did they vote for this man that you are decreeing, that you are declaring? Twelve years ago, jurisprudence might not have been like that. But our jurisprudence will appear to be migrating, will appear to be oscillating towards the, what I would call a situation whereby the courts in Nigeria are besieged with powers and authority and jurisdiction, which other courts in other parts of the world do not have. And before I round up on this question, the largest democracy in the world is India. We have, when you go to our library there, you see Indian law reports. The most advanced democracy in the world today in terms of presidential system of government is the USA. When you go to the library, you see law reports of the US up to their Supreme Court. You see Canada, you see Australia practicing federalism, the courts. None of their courts, I dare say, none of their courts possesses the powers or exercises the powers that the courts in Nigeria exercise. So we are working up to see the democratization of Nigeria being surrendered either by the politicians or by nuances of politics to the judiciary. To me, it's not true. And I will take a break 
He's saying that involvement of the judiciary in political matters, matters that are so sensitive, they are so delicate, they are so fragile, is dangerous. It will erode the respect people have for the judiciary. Now, Chief, a, a number of people would say that you are in a very good position to make the comments that you're making. You, you are uh, a senior advocate of Niger of many, many years standing. Um, you are currently the leader of the body of benches. Uh, you have been on the National Judicial uh, 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 Council. Uh, you have been in charge of the Nigerian Bar Association. So virtually every institution that is in the legal profession, the only thing you haven't been is a judge. Um, <laughs> but every other thing you have been. So it brings up the question I was trying to bring up earlier when you were speaking, and that had to do with the process of recruitment. Some of the people I've spoken to have said, Nigeria is one of the jurisdictions where, unlike what happens elsewhere, since we are making comparisons, the brightest of the profession don't end up as judges. That many of those who are very bright, who have a very good idea, very good interest in the law, who are extremely successful, somehow avoid being on the uh, on the bench, and that um, that has something to do with, and that again, in the last 12 years, since that's the period we're taking a look at, that some of the processes of recruitment, even of judges uh, themselves from the pool of lawyers, uh, has also been somewhat tainted by the things you mentioned earlier, the integrity, trust issues, and all of that, and that that has affected even the quality of those who are applying uh, to be some of those things that some people have said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this because some of the people who are on this with me are not people that I happen to know deliberately are not in that line. Is it given someone in your position who can see the overview, is that a fair assessment? And is that what we are seeing the result of? in some of the things that you've mentioned already, forum shopping, uh, the idea that uh, you know, people don't want to go back and look at honest mistakes that they've made as human beings, and that in, even in terms of uh, the quality of the judgments that are being produced, uh, some of your colleagues that I've spoken to referred to justices like uh, Kyle Deshaw, you mentioned, Chukudi Fokbuta, uh, a whole host of others like that whose judgments even today, when people read them, and they don't have to be lawyers to read them, the logic is lucid, is obvious, and the balance is clear. Uh, Ladi, your question is so heavily loaded. <laughs> it's um, about uh, five, six questions in one. It's a journalistic bombshell. <laughs> but let me try to answer. I wouldn't say that the best in the legal profession have not been going to the bench. That will not be fair. Are they talking about Adimola was on the bench? Elias, perhaps the best author Nigeria has produced, was on the bench. Akiola Aguda was on the bench. Unamani was on the bench. Koka was on the bench. A good number of them. Oputa was on the bench. Kao Deesho was on the bench. Kalibi White, a PhD holder, was on the bench. Nikki Tomi, Nikki Tobi, a PhD holder, a professor of law, was on the bench, going to the, getting to the Supreme Court. Idibe was on the bench. Obaseki was on the bench. Belo, one of the best prose writers on the bench by my own estimation, was on the bench a gentleman. So it may be, it would be unfair. It would also be unfair to say that those who are there today are not good, that they are not qualitative. No, I will not say that. I won't say that. And I will not say that because it would be unfair. But 
the process of appointment is wrong. And within the past 12 years, it has departed, it has deviated from what it used to be. Now, how was it before in Nigeria we compare with now? And what does the law say? The law talks of appointment. We are talking of appointment, we are not talking of elevation. We are not talking of promotion. We are not talking of preferment. It's only in the church, particularly in the Anglican communion, that you have preferment. The bishop can prefer, you know, an ordinary clergy, make him, you know, an archdeacon. The house of bishops can decide to make an archdeacon or whoever a bishop. That is preferment. But the concern talks of appointment. And when you appoint, there must be an interview. You go into the integrity, you go into scholarship, you go into character, you go into learning, you go into independence. You go even into family life. We should do it the way it should be. That is a concern of some of us. And I belong to this school of thought that the constituent does not say that for you to be a justice of the court of appeal, you must be promoted or elevated from the high court to the court of appeal. There is no where in the ground law. It is not done anywhere. I will not say I stand to be corrected. I'm so sure of what I'm saying. It's not done anywhere, not even in nearby Ghana. In Ghana, you can't get to the Supreme Court from three branches of the legal profession, from serving justices, then from the academia, and from legal practitioners. Equal, in equal shares. A good number of those who have mounted the saddle as chief just or chief justices or chief judge in the United States, they you know, come from they came from outside. For you to be appointed, you must go through the crucible. We must see you, we must know you. I remember at the um, colloquium for your 70th birthday. Uh, there were quite a lot of speeches, uh, and one central theme that a lot of people pointed out was that somehow corruption and some element of nepotism had crept in to the judiciary, and that a lot of the things you're pointing out were the result of that. Even the issue of adjudication of political cases, subverting the people's will, on the altar of law and a number of other things uh, along those lines were the result of corruption. And that because lawyers, by definition, are some of the best positioned and best prepared people to, I don't want to use the word subvert, but to adjust the law to suit their circumstances, uh, they tend to get away with it a lot. And that in the last decade plus that we've talked about, a number of lawyers, too, have been put in the spotlight. I don't want to mention any names, but a number of lawyers, some of them quite senior, some of them learned silks like yourself, have been put in the spotlight uh, for acts, uh, professional acts, not completely of top-notch standard. Let me, let me choose my words carefully yeah, because yeah. I'm talking about lawyers here. Yeah. Now, in that kind of situation, and knowing what you know and what you have already talked about, is there also a problem with our legal recruitment process, the recruitment that lawyers themselves go through, uh, the schools they go, the um, going to law school, because even the issue of law school, I was still reading an article about a week ago where they were saying, oh, the law school should be spread across the six geopolitical zones, and there were arguments as to whether that would dilute the quality of the teaching and uh, dilute the number, uh, in exponentially increase the number while not providing for what jobs those people so produced would then end up doing and so on. So I, I wonder if, again, given the background that you've given, there is a problem with this recruitment process. Thank you. Now, 
Let me say this. When I was on the NJC too, we devised criteria. And I want to repeat, under the auspices of the Honorable Chief Justice of Nigeria then, Honorable Justice Aluma Mukta, for lawyers who want to go to the Supreme Court, that they should not have less than the minimum requirement to attain the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria. X number of cases at the Court of, at the court of Appeal, X number at the Supreme Court, good character, good standing, referees, and what have you. And then we fish in the same pond we know ourselves. Before I can stick my neck or put pen on paper to write reference for anybody, not just to go to the bench, but even to, uh, to, for any position at all, I must be convinced that I know that person fairly well. And I will put it there to the best of my knowledge. It's of good standing, it's of good learning, it's of good character. It is, not in the legal, it is not in the legal profession alone that we have bad characters. And mind you, what does the Bible say about man? It says the heart of man is inherently wicked. So right from the time of creation, God himself knows. There is no past tense for God that man is, you know, man is rebellious. So don't let us say because some lawyers have been you know, top-notch lawyers using your word, that uh, you know, they have been found wanting. Yes, and they have been disciplined. Some of them have been disciplined, and we know them. We know ourselves. Do you know that in Britain, you cannot even be a high court judge, except you are taking the silk. We keep on quoting Lord Denny and others with relish. We forget about the background. Again, I'm not saying that except you are a senior advocate of Nigeria. No, you cannot be good. There are people who are not even senior advocates who are better than those who are senior advocates, who are better than me. And I'm not saying, let us scatter everything. I'm saying, let it be equitable. Let it spread amongst the you know, branches of the profession. It was so, that was the way it was being done. How did we come about stopping it? And has it paid us? And we all know that. Before we round this up, I must ask this, Chief, because you are in a unique position to look at it. With the benefit of hindsight, um, also within the last decade, uh, something unprecedented happened to the judicial system, the legal system, let's put it that way, um, when it appeared as if uh, an attack was launched by the executive arm of government uh, using the instrumentality of the security and anti-corruption agencies against some of those we have talked about, the judges in particular, and even lawyers. And many people now, today, trace some of the difficulties and the challenges that have come out to that attack, that because it tended to expose what was previously uh, a fairly hallowed ground to public ridicule, if you like, the, spec the spectacle of judges being frog matched with their hands uh, put together behind them and, you know, away into... Manacled. Yes, manacled and, and, and put before the dock uh, and so on. You, you had already referenced the Chief Justice of the Federation, a serving Chief Justice, uh, being uh, tried by a Could junior... A junior... Code uh, of Conduct, that yes. even doesn't have jurisdiction. Over. Now, I, I, I wonder now that today when someone like you looks at it with the benefit of hindsight, was that seeming move an expose on what was needed to have been done in the judicial system, or was it a short-sighted maneuver that has now boomeranged? Pointedly, 
the government was wrong. It was barbaric. It should never have been done. You don't go and ransack judges' houses overnight. Were they not available during the day? It's even criminal on the part of government to go and ransack or to have gone to ransack through the DSS, the houses of some individual judges at night. How would the justices even differentiate those who came in disguise as DSS from armed robbers, from bandits? Did they not see them during the day? And at our level, at my level, I will speak out my mind. I addressed a press conference in my country home in Ikele, and I condemned what the government did. Nearly all the national newspapers carried it. And I challenged them to name anywhere where it has happened. Some friends of mine called me. They said, Wally, why are you defending these judges? They started saying some things. I said, I'm defending the institution. I'm defending the system, not the individuals. And even the individuals also, they deserve their right to human dignity. The Constitution provides for it. The Constitution protects it. I am not saying that any judge or any lawyer who has committed an infraction against the law or is caught taking bribe, who is corrupt, should be spared. No. I've never done it and I will never do it. But there is a way, there is a system. Have governors not been accused? No, let us face it. Have presidents, past presidents, not been accused, even sitting presidents, ministers, serving ministers, commissioners at state level? Is that the way you have treated them? Why calling the dog a bad name in the judiciary in order to hang it? Even an armed robber deserves a right to his human dignity when you are, even, when you are prosecuting him. That was my position, and that position has not changed. What the government did was lawless. It was barbaric. It, is, you know, it was and still remains unacceptable. And they still, they still attempted it just recently against uh, Justice uh, Mary Peter Odili, and I spoke. And I asked a question, a rhetorical question, that assuming they got her arrested, would they have caught her? more questions than answers. So that's not the way to be still done. Now, the, the problem we have in Nigeria is this. Those who are in power believe also that they know it all. We are talking about our profession now, the, you know, the executive and the legislature. They believe that they know it all. You don't call people who, know what, who, who have ideas. In 1612 or so, there was or there were accusations, 16, about some 500, judges. 500 years ago. Oh, yes, oh, yes. People don't learn, and they don't want to listen. They don't want to be educated. They don't want to hear in the United Kingdom, even against the Lord Chief Justice. What happened? What did they do? They set up a commission of inquiry Laddie, <laughs> people came, evidence was given. They invited the gentleman, he did not come. Rather, he pleaded guilty. Are we listening? Do you want to go, do we want to go into the archives? Do you want to go into presidents? Law is about precedence. Not that you will go and arrest them. You can set up a commission of inquiry. Anybody who has anything to say about anybody, say it. 
Do you have anything to say in that type of conjunction of inquiry that Wale Wale Ola and Kwekwa has even made overtures? So, so, say it. Let that judge listen. It's not a question of NJCO. We are talking of, and it's very important that it is done. It's not a question of NJC. It's a question of inquiry. The judge, the chief judge was found guilty. What did he say? He said, from now on, I will distance myself from corruption like a plague. But in spite of that, he was sentenced to prison. He was banned from holding public office. He was banned from contesting election, from going to parliament, from going to the House of Lords, and he died. And since then, and what was even the allegation? Just, you know, <laughs> stipends. 16, 16, 12 or so in Great Britain. Then today, it stopped. Today you can't hear, nobody can even talk of it. In America, you can't say you want to bribe a judge. How will you have the, you know, Audacity, the infantry. How can you be so brazen? You can't. The judiciary is to correct the ease of the society. I've also read a tale of two cities. You have read a tale of two cities. Now, if you have read a tale of two cities, there must be a bulwark at a point in time. That tale of two cities is really the difference between two great European countries. Because some people see some others, leaders, as soccer. The Methodist, the Wesleys, and the Wesleyans. Although they were initially Anglicans. <laughs> now, judiciary should be the soccer. So I will not subscribe to read that because you have you no know, insecurity, because there is bribery, because there is corruption, because there is uh, inhumanity of man. No, 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 no. Because that's why the judiciary is there. That's why we run to the judiciary. That's why we migrate there. That's why we say, you know, that please adjudicate between us, settle our differences. But by and large, we have problems in the land. And the problems, I want to say this, I might be you know, off the cuff, is because of our constitution. How so? Nigeria is not operating any constitution known to honesty, entrenched in group faith, brought about by unanimity of the people, acceptable to federalism. And again, that is also, we also have that problem with the judiciary. Because of the Nigerian situation, we have a unitary system. That's what we run. Hydra-headed, don't let us pretend. And I've said it over and over, and I'll continue to say it. And that's unitarism has also created to the judiciary. Today, the entire Nigerian judiciary is, is unitarized. The Supreme Court is federal. Federal Court of Appeal, I mean, the Court of Appeal is federal. Federal High Court is federal. FCT is federal. National Industrial Court is federal. Customary Court of Appeal or the Federal High Court is federal. Sharia Court of Appeal, the Federal High Court is federal all jurisdictions, that the Kyodea chance of this world, that the Oputas of this world, that the Belos of this world, when they were in their respective high courts exercised, making the law to be profound, succulent, rich, exciting, they are now vested in the different federal high courts or federal courts. Do you know that under the 1963 Constitution, each state was entitled to have its own court of appeal? The Western Nigeria had its own court of appeal. 
It was that call of appeal that the federal government, military government, under Obasanjo abolished. Esho was there before he went to become the chief judge of Oyo State. Oyemaje saw this world, Adimola saw this world, fantastic court. Let us face it, because we're talking of how to reform the system. There is no justification in a state, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nation like Nigeria, purporting to practice federalism, where even the Supreme Court should be overburdened with unnecessary jurisdictions in respect of land matters from Yoruba land, in respect of divorce, in respect of family matters, shifting matters. How do they know? I don't want us to be deceiving ourselves. Assuming I'm even appointed to the Supreme Court today, I'm above the age, but assuming, and I'm sitting there, and you bring a matter on appeal in respect of Kanuri native law and custom, or Igbo native law and custom, or Igbo land, Igbo land tenure system, and I sit there, and I'm writing judgment. I'm a Yoruba man. What do I know about that? That those kind of cases to stop at the state, either Court of Appeal or Supreme Court. Go to the United States of America. His state has its own Supreme Court. We are running into trouble. We are inching there. And time is not in our favor. And I'm not tickled by what the National Assembly is doing. They are not being fair to themselves. They are not being fair to us. They claim to be amending the Constitution. What are, they, what are they amending? And I want to repeat it. Do you amend something that is not amendable? When you want to amend the Constitution, by the way, Lati, where do you start? You start from the preamble. We the people. Oh, yes. They have to amend it. Why are they running away from it? If they cannot amend the preamble, if the preamble is not amendable, then it means the constitution is not amendable. Come on. They have to start from it. Do you start reading your letter from the back page? Do you? No. No, they have to start from the preamble. That means the preamble is fake. We, the people, who are the we? When did we meet? And why can't we do it? I've studied the constitutions of the world. And I say this also with every sense of humility. There is no constitution that is near as fake, near as deceitful, near as make-believe in nature and in content as the constitution, as the, what we call the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999, as amended. What are they amending? I challenge them, and I challenge the National Assembly. And they must answer this question. When you are amending, you first, some, some, first of all start from the preamble. Because if the people didn't meet and they put it there, by the respected or by the, 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 the uh, Abdul Salam military government, they say, we the people. You must first amend it. If they're going to amend it, what should it say? I wouldn't know. If they, they can't amend it, if they cannot amend then let us have a constitution for ourselves. Chief Oladi <laughs> Bekon, uh, it's, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to have tapped from your well of knowledge. And we only hope that those uh, who uh, can take decisive action about this are listening and have listened. And that, um, as you said, paradise regained Thank will be you. our lot in the time to come. Thank, Thank you so you. much for speaking Thank with you. us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Oladi. It's a pleasure having you. And, um, my love to all our people in channel. Thank you very and much. Thank God for channel. Thank God. Thank, Thank God. God. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.